Good afternoon. On behalf of the Anaheim Public Library, I would like to welcome you to the 2021 NEA Big Read. My name is Beatriz Preciado and I am a librarian at the Haskett Library. The selected title for this year is In the Time of the Butterflies by Julia Alvarez. The NEA Big Read is a program of the National Endowment for the Arts in partnership with Arts Midwest. Before we begin our presentation, I wanted to mention there will be a Q&A session later in the presentation. You'll be able to ask questions by typing them in the chat box. It is now my pleasure to introduce our distinguished author, Julia Alvarez. Julia Alvarez has written novels, collections of poems, nonfiction, and numerous books for young readers. She is a recipient of the 2013 National Medal of Arts. Alvarez is one of the founders of Border of Lights, a movement to promote peace and collaboration between Haiti and the Dominican Republic. I hope you enjoyed today's event. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tony Lamb, and I'm a librarian here. Just want to uh, let you know how things are going to go today. And it's such an honor to have author Julia Alvarez. And uh, Julia has amazing uh, PowerPoint presentation and story uh, of her, her family. And afterward, you can send in, uh, you can forward your questions, Q&A, comments, and I will read them, and Mr. Alvarez will answer your questions accordingly. So let's get the program started. Thank you. Hello. I am hoping that I uh, will get this technology right, and I hope you forgive me if uh, I'm on a learning curve with all of this. Uh, I think many of us are, hadn't heard of uh, Zoom, uh, in the in, te in terms of technology till uh, until a year and a half or so ago. And uh, this is a whole new platform for me, Google Chrome. So um, forgive me if I've if I fumble a little bit, but I'm very, very happy to be in Hannah Anaheim, even if it is um, uh, digitally. Uh, it is my, I think, my last uh, appearance on the Big Read uh, program, which I've been doing for years within the Time of the Butterflies throughout the United States. Um, but this is the last stop on the tour, and so it's very special. Uh, thank you for, for having me and um, celebrating with me this wonderful program that brings people in a community together um, around a book uh, that they read together and that really elicits their own stories uh, that they begin to share. It's a wonderful way to really come down to the basic, a very basic human need to tell stories, to make narratives, um, to share being uh, in another person's shoes. And I think it's one of the, I think it's the antidote for in many ways for our disunited uh, uh, states of America to have um, this wonderful program. So thank you for having me. Thank you to all your librarians that have brought me here. Um, uh, Tony, uh, the MC and, and Beatrice for your uh, introduction, Guadalupe, Gomez and, and Chloe uh, helping with the technology. Uh, I always, it, it's not just um, Dominican good manners that you always give las gracias, um, but it's that I've come to realize now that I'm as old as I am, that you don't get anywhere without a lot of shoulders to stand on. And a lot of times, if you're getting the attention, um, people aren't seeing those shoulders. And um, you can almost sometimes uh, fool yourself that you got there by yourself, but you didn't. So thank you. So what I thought I'd do is share um, a little bit of my story as an author, how I came to write in the time of the butterflies, just give you a little background, some images uh, to bring the story before your eyes. And, and then hopefully um, if you have questions, um, or I hope you have questions, I just um, might not have answers, but I have, thoughts and musings and maybe added questions. So I will now uh, try to share my screen. 
So um, the cover, uh, now that uh, the book has been around, uh, let's see, 27 years, uh, it has had many different covers, but perhaps this is one of my favorites. I um, have really gotten attached to this cover, um, but I shouldn't get too attached because before I know it, there's a new edition. Uh, so this came out two years ago uh, and there will be a new edition and I will show you the new covers that are coming at the very end. Um, anyhow, a little bit about me as an, as a, as a person, um, how did I get started? I um, actually was born in Nueva York, New York City. Uh, my parents were there. Um, my father was already persona non grata in the Dominican Republic, and so he was living in New York. And so I was actually born in New York, but my parents were so homesick, uh, they did not take to this country easily. And so they decided to go back and there was a liberalization of the regime in which people that had been thrown out before were welcomed back. My father didn't think anything really had changed, but my mother was homesick and uh, now that she had a family, she wanted to raise them in the midst of La Familia. So they went back when I was a month old. This is the only picture I have of the uh, when I was in Nueva York, you can see the great of the, of the New York City window uh, in the background. So we returned. Um, people often ask what it was like to grow up in the Dominican Republic in a dictatorship. Well, we were shielded from the dictatorship as children uh, because I had a large, wonderful, warm, uh, uh, kooky familia, all kinds. Uh, some of them are pictured here uh, to give you a little sense of, uh, of that family. My father was the youngest of 25 kids. Uh, the first wife had 10 and then she died, amazingly, not in childbirth. And my grandfather um, married again and the second wife had 15 and my father was the youngest of the 15. So I had tias and uncles. I was raised by so many people and so many wonderful storytellers and also great background for a writer because you know in a large family like that there's all kinds of all kinds of characters so i i felt very loved and and protected um this is one of the sunday gatherings that they would have every once in a while a photographer would come uh a little guy with a hood that he put over his head and take a picture. There was no uh, wide angle lens, so he took different sittings. My grandmother sits in the center there. Um, a lot of the kids are drinking coconut water and even some of the young ladies. Um, so what was it like? I always say my childhood, and you see a picture of me as a toddler. The last time I was chubby and blonde. And I, call, I say my childhood, there was always a hand to hold. There was always a hand to hold. All you did was reach up, somebody would take your hand, um, and all you had to do is say, I tell me, I cuentame un cuento, tell me a story, and there was always somebody willing to tell you a story. It was an oral culture. No books, no libraries, no public libraries unheard of, but the world's greatest storytellers. <clears throat> so I never read much. Kids love to hear this. But I flunked every grade through fifth grade, all my grades in the DR, I didn't do very well. It was a, a, a school where you learned by discipline and mem you had to memorize things. Uh, it was a dictatorship. Uh, so the textbooks were the official textbooks. It was boring. And I did not like it, did not pay attention. Uh, often was sent home with a teacher's note saying, Julia does not pay attention. But the minute that I got into my familia um, and an auntie or mommy or my abuelita started telling a story, I'd be right there listening. Um, so I love stories. And I can only remember one picture book I got as a little girl. And that story I fell in love with. It was The Arabian Nights. And it told the story of this young girl who had been living in a cruel kingdom with a cruel sultan who was killing all the women in the kingdom. 
And um, he would have them come brought to his bedroom at night and at dawn he would execute them. And so Shahrazad, that was the girl's name. Uh, and she looked like a Dominican girl instead of blonde, blue eyed, like most of the storybook princesses. She asked the Sultan if she could tell him a story. And he said, why not? You know, and so she spent what was supposed to be her last night on earth telling a story. She finished it. The Sultan loved it and he said, tell me another one. She started another one and just then the sun was coming up. So she had to stop because it was her turn to be executed. He said, no, you'll survive one more night so you can finish that story. Next night she finished that story. He said, oh, that was fantastic. Tell me another one. And this went on for a thousand and one nights. Anyhow, at the end of that time, the Sultan was so in love with the storyteller, so in love with story stories, had learned so much. His heart had been broken open and he was full of compassion. And um, Shahrazad saved not only her life, but the lives of all the women left in the kingdom and also changed the Sultan's heart. So this was a really important story for me to read. Not that I analyzed it or anything, but I thought, oh, that's, I didn't know stories could do that. I want, I want to do that. Um, I had no idea how to do that, but it was a dream, a little seed put in my imagination by the storybook. Anyhow, it was a dictatorship. We had a very cruel Sultan, Trujillo, our dictator, for 31 years. He too uh, was rapacious. He killed people, disappeared people. Um, women were not safe. Um, parents did not like for their young girls to go out in public because if he saw them and he wanted them, that was, she had to be delivered over to him. Uh, he was a cruel man. And, um, and yet, you know, I say I had a happy childhood because I had my familia around me, their affection, their cariño, their stories. Um, but three women, uh, Minerva on the right uh, with her guitar, Maria Teresa with a braid on the right, Patria, um, three women and their compañeros, their husbands started an underground movement to depose the dictator. And um, in the time of the butterflies it is their story uh, based on, on, on a true story. Um, they were known as, everybody had a code name, a secret name. So they were known as Las Mariposas, maybe because their last name was Mirabal, but also because of the symbolic nature of butterflies. Um, and they started this underground. And of course, um, they gave their lives to it because um, the dictator ambushed them on their way back from visiting their jailed husbands and killed them uh, along with the driver who had been the only one willing to drive them because rumors were flying that the mariposas were going to be killed. So Rufino de la Cruz is also pictured here because he was he was a hero too. <clears throat> so my family was um, suddenly in great danger. Uh, I showed three pictures of three of my uncles who were involved. Uh, the one in the middle, Huascar Tejeda, and the one on the right, Robert Reed, um, did not make it. Uh, they, he, they were killed by the, by the dictator's son. My uncle, uh, Manuel, uh, upper left uh, was um, survived the torture chambers that he was in for the last nine months of the dictatorship, amazingly. This is the only picture that I have of my father. Uh, he is at the one in camouflage holding uh, his boots. And um, one of the things that the underground did because they wanted to go practice maneuvers for coming together and ambushing the dictator. So they would go up in the mountains and nobody was allowed a gun. Um, they were only allowed hunting rifles. So all of the underground suddenly became hunters and they would go up for the weekends. I still remember my father would come back from hunting guinea hens uh, and he would bring some guinea hens. You see them on the right because 
he, that was their al alibi. So that, that's a picture, the only picture of my father I have. He too, with these uncles, were in the same group. When the uncles were seized um, and our own house was surrounded, we had to flee the country in a hurry. And father had a contact, a, a, a consul, Manuel Chavez, uh, a Mexican-American who was posted in the Dominican Republic who got us out. So we landed in the United States of America. I had always heard about Lady Liberty, the land of the brave and the home of the free. I just was so homesick. I didn't want to leave my wonderful familia, but I kept hearing from mommy and papi that we would at last be free that this was the greatest country, um, the one that offered everybody a chance and an opportunity. However, we landed in 1960, and what I saw on the television and all around me did not confirm that story I've been told. The civil rights movement was still getting started. Signs like the one, we serve whites only, no Spanish or Mexicans, were still posted. Um, the Ku Klux Klan was active. And so I was seeing on the television people being hosed down, people being prevented from executing their base, basic right to vote. And so I thought, it, how is this different from where we had come from? I want to go home. And what I think is that Lady Liberty and what she represents is a beacon to the world. But when we act like this as Americans, as citizens of the United States or the world, she is so ashamed of us. She covers her face with shame. Um, so this is what we experienced when we came. A lot of prejudice and a lot of unwelcome names being called um, at us in the playground. So I, of course, I was, I was very homesick. Soon after we came, we arrived August 6, 1960. A couple of months later, the Miravar sisters were, were killed, November 25th, 1960. I uh, have translated the article that appeared in the Dominican Republic, um, an article that, that made it sound as if they hadn't been killed, but they had had a terrible car accident. Uh, however, in Time Magazine, I found this article because I remember Papi bringing that Time Magazine to our apartment and uh, it reported that there had been this supposed accident, but it was very suspicious and the dictator's hand was in it. So um, this was what we had escaped. So um, my family was four girls and there's with Papi. Um, the four of us. Uh, this was a little later after our immigration, but I always felt like haunted by the stories of the Mirabar sisters. They were the sisters that had lost their lives to free the country, which in fact happened uh, within the year of their of their murder, because they the Dominican people were so mobilized by that tragedy that they took up. Uh, you know, they had not, they had been too fearful to take up the fight for their freedom and that their story mobilized the nation, but they didn't make it. And so I always felt haunted by the story. I felt like our freedom was gained by them. And I felt like I owed them a debt. And one of the things that surprised me is history classes I was taking about the Americas, the whole hemisphere. Nobody had ever heard of them. They weren't in any books. And I thought, why don't they know the stories? Why, why isn't their story known? And Papi, of course, was telling me stories about them, about the underground, about the dictatorship, now safely on American soil. So I knew that that was a story as I decided that I was going to be a storyteller, that I wanted to be like Shahrazad, and I wanted to write stories down. I decided I wanted to I wanted to write their story down. So I went back to do the research since as I mentioned nothing had been written about them. And I had in a small country like the Dominican Republic and with so many relatives as you know, uh 
everybody knows someone who knows someone who knows the person you want to talk to. And it's just so happened that um, my aunt's um, friend knew the daughter, Patya's daughter, um, who took me up to meet Doña Deve. And this was the house that the girls grew up in, where they were born. And there is um, meeting Deve in the early 80s. And, um, and listening firsthand to the story of her sisters and growing up in the dictatorship, I became passionate about telling this story. Um, it was published in 1984, 1994, and um, I've seen in the course of its publication, in, in the course of the story spreading, um, the Mirabar sisters becoming national heroines, first of all. And this is the poster that appeared on their, the 25th anniversary of their death in 1985, when I actually was down there doing a lot of my research. Um, and they were, they appear November 25th is like a July 4th kind of day for the Dominican Republic. Uh, the obelisk, uh, four sides, each one, um, focusing on one or another of the sisters, that's right in the capital. And you know you've made it when you get your picture on, on currency. They're also on the 200 peso bill. Um, so they were, they became national heroines. But the amazing thing was in 1999, the United Nations declared November 25th, the day of their murder, International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women in their honor. It's amazing that this story, these four um, young women, um, three of them who lost their lives, became not just national symbols, but international symbols. And November 25th is celebrated around, or commemorated is a more accurate word, around the world. Uh, in their honor. And so just a few pictures of the different um, gatherings and commemorations that people have sent me pictures of or links to. Uh, and these are just a few. So this is November 25th, um, commemorated in India by women. Um, this is November 25th in, of all places, Afghanistan, very much in our hearts these days women there as well. So this is their bravery, their courage, um, a gathering on November 25th. This is um, a commemoration in Romania on November 25th. Here's one in Spain. Uh, these are masking faces of women that have suffered violence in one form of, or another. Uh, this is girls uh, commemorating with um, parading through the streets on November 25th in Thailand, here in Peru. And amazing things, the things that happen, the way a story can inspire people. An uh, American woman read the novel and uh, decided she, she had started an ecotourism company in the Dominican Republic. And she sold the ecotourism company and decided to work with young girls, street girls, who would otherwise fall prey to uh, sexual tourism among, uh, you know, being used by um, different resorts and um, not having much of a future, living in poverty. And uh, she started this, the Mariposa DR Foundation. And uh, she educates young girls, eight to 18. Uh, many go on to college, become professionals. So it's, a, it's an amazing way that a story can inspire people to be activists and to change the world. And their logo on the other side of that beautiful t-shirt, they were getting ready to do a performance that day as a fundraiser. On the other side is their logo that says, I am the world's most powerful force for change. Soy la fuerza más potente para cambiar el mundo. Um, I myself and my husband, Bill, who farms, uh, decided to start a project. I've always wanted to go back and not just write about the DR, but 
do something there uh, because I feel like I got an opportunity and not everyone does. And so we ended up at this mountain community um, discovering that this was the school upper left. Um, most of the kids or and adults in this community of uh, 40 families did not know how to read or write. Uh, so they were coffee farmers being pushed out of farming by farming their coffee by the big agribusiness companies that were coming in um, and buying up farmland and uh, putting them out of business. So it was an impoverished community. So Bill and I started buying some of the farmland, gathering the farmers together, growing organic. We got certification for organic fair trade coffee and bringing it to the United States. <clears throat> that was Bill's project, but I wanted to do something with reading because here I am writing books and I say that books belong to everyone, but you have to have the key to that, that treasure chest. You have to know how to read. So we started a school in the community. For many years, I was a teacher at the local college here, Middlebury College. And so I had many students that wanted to volunteer. After graduation, we would select one or two volunteers to go down when we opened the school that is shown at the lower in the lower slide. So <clears throat> soon we had readers. When you have readers, you need a library. Yes. Um, this must be the first public library <laughs> uh, in up in the mountains of the Dominican Republic. We had amazing <clears throat> generosity from publishers donating books. And here are new readers in the community uh, taking out books. And my favorite is when we had this project with a volunteer teacher where they wrote their own little alphabet books and uh, they became part of the collection. Of course, we had to have um, butterfly making uh, workshops with clothespins. And so um, two little boys are, are showing their works of art there. This is an amazing uh, thing that one of the volunteers, Ria Trove, who is there, <clears throat> she is uh, Dede, Doña Dede is in the center. She is Dede, to Dede's right. She's originally from India, but she went down uh, to Alta Gracia, the name of the farm, and she started, uh, she do, She was doing the, the school for the kids, but she started a literacy project for the young mothers who didn't know much reading. And um, she started a reading club. Mostly she read to them, but the first book was In El Tiempo de las Mariposas. And the reward for reading um, in the time of the butterflies was she hired a van and she took them down and they got to meet Doña Bebe. Um, this was before Doña Bebe died 2016. Uh, so it was an amazing experience for them that they, they still talk about. Uh, they read the book and, and then they met the actual living uh, person that is a, a character in the book. So um, very gratifying to me. So I said there was gonna be a new cover. Um, this is the Penguin uh, Classic Series and uh, they're going to come out November 16, 2021 with this beautiful hardcover edition. Um, and I am really um, honored and gratified that Maxine Hong Kingston, who was my mentor muse because when she published Woman Warrior in the late 70s, there, were, there was no literature um, by ethnic writers, um, writers of, of color. I mean, none of that even vocabulary was out there, but she wrote The Woman Warrior and it was an amazing book. Um, and it was open the gates because critics thought it was a, a masterpiece. And I read it and I felt like, oh, it can be done. And to have her then write the foreword for In the Time of the Butterflies, the new edition, uh, is really gratifying. So this is the last slide. Um, I love the slide on the right, the butterfly and the pen, uh, because it's always my hope, uh, my, my goal to be a writer who is also an activist, but who uses, who really, her activism comes out of her passion for writing. And I always say to people who want to be activists, find what you love. 
Find what wakes you up because what the world needs is people who are awake, people who are in love, because then what you give to the world, what you, when you're doing what you love in service to your community, your country, to our planet, when you do what you love, you're putting love in the world. And that's what we all need. And the other is a, a wonderful young uh, Dominican artist, Gabby D'Alessandro. And she does amazing things with butterflies. And this is the way I often feel um, with gratitude, my heart bursting um, with uh, butterflies. So that's it for my presentation. And I will now join you and Tony. Uh, thank you so much for that was the that was so powerful, such a powerful presentation and strong message of hope and the idea of being protected by family uh, around, you know, I mean, I can identify it as I have lived through communist, communism in Vietnam and the wow. ideas of stories and being surrounded with family. You have that, that feelings of safety. It's extremely powerful. And to hear your journey about how you uh, you got from your, well, you're born in New York and you get back to Dominic, Dominican and have such a, a loving environment and the love of, of storytelling, 101 the Arabian Nights is just one of those amazing books because it's fascinating. Um, and thank you for the presentation. We do have a question. One of the question is, there you go, they put a caption for you. In your opinion, how can we be more aware of history, such as the story of the Maribel sisters in our community? Well, that is, I think, one of the reasons that I really love the Big Read program. Um, for those of you that might not be that acquainted, what they do is um, the Big Read program is a national program they work with libraries and communities. The, the community, the libraries, they decide what book. They decide what book um, they want to read from a list given to them. And then the community um, gets these books. They give them free to uh, people that want to participate. They tell that people read them. They have workshops just like you've had. Uh, and Anaheim, uh, not just on the books, but cooking from that country, dance from that country, history lectures from that country, and uh, people get to know the stories of other communities, other peoples, because the amazing thing about reading is that when you read, you become the other. I mean, what an amazing skill. If we could do that in real time if we could meet people and get in their shoes and in their hearts and imaginations what a way to build a loving a loving community and so i think this big read program is a wonderful way to do it big shout out to the libraries when we came to this country we couldn't afford books we had never owned books we weren't even in the in the sort of a uh, tradition or habit of having books, but my teacher sent me to the library and I discovered the public library, which is, you you know, you we take things for granted because we don't know, as I said, we started that little library up in the mountains at first. You know, people have private libraries there. There are the big government libraries uh, in the capital, but public libraries everywhere. Um, that is a great, community building um, institution. And many times, at least in our local uh, public library, there are reading groups, there's workshops, um, there are visiting authors. And so um, we get to know uh, uh, all the stories that we, that we want to, um, that we want to share and learn about uh, so that we can enlarge our imaginations. I always say that we have to be who we are, <clears throat> but we can become the larger version of ourselves. That, uh, um, and and that happens, I think, through reading. Thank you. Oh, that, thanks for a big shout out to the libraries. Indeed, I think uh, libraries are the cornerstones of freedom, freedom of speech, truly. 
Um, and the other thing I want to say is, you know, and this happened a lot when I was teaching creative writing to my students. They said, oh, I don't, I don't have any real interesting stories to tell. I said, do you have a grandparent? Do you have an auntie? Do you have an uncle? Do you have a neighbor? You know, uh, do you have a, a local farmer? Um, does a plumber come to your house? I mean, people are people are walking little libraries too. There's so many stories out there, um, and once you learn someone's story, they're not. It, it's too. It's no longer that easy to dismiss them with a label uh, and call them a name and put them over there, them and us. They become a part of you. That is true. Um, uh, you see, from uh, Mary O'Quinn say fabulous presentation, muchas gracias. And uh, Joanne Hein Petit said, replying to uh, Mary O'Quinn say, talking about being awake, what a timely words we need to we need now. So the way to do it, you know, people say, well, what do I do? Okay, um, what movement do I join? What march of protest and those things are important but i really believe that the activism that is sustainable the activism that ultimately um contributes most to the world is when you are your activism comes out of the thing you love to do you know your passion then it doesn't come out out of anger and outrage and it comes it comes out of your love of something and you're putting when your activism um when you're doing that activism and and there's the added thing not just for yourself but in service to your community you're putting love in the world because you're putting you're putting what brought you awake into the world and so it's you know it's what made you come awake and the world needs people who are awake yeah. and um and just to expound on what you said about the idea of, you know, you said the other, uh, what allowed me to brag a little bit as an English major where I'm reading the Edward Sae, where I said the other, where, uh, you know, things like the, the idea that happened in the literature of our own way, we can present that, bridging that understanding of sometimes people, uh, ignorance is the lack of understanding of others. And sometimes when you have that literature available, people yeah. will understand who you are your culture your difference the differences so i appreciate that you brought it up that point oh questions are coming in like <laughs> okay <laughs> let's see uh june glenn said thank you for opening the word of others to us there i just talk about that there is so much for us to learn and uh let's see Guadalupe Gomez watching and she said the tragedies and the joys that we've experienced shared can be can be become the, someone else hope the star they look for to comfort and the guidance while continue their own journey and thank you for the great presentation that's very poetic yes indeed um yeah. let's see what else uh okay and also uh let's see uh yeah, you know, amazing description of activi activism. Thank you for those wise words, Julia. And uh, let's see. Uh, okay. I do have uh, some questions. Um, well, while we wait for some more questions to come in, uh, I would like, to, uh, you know how you used to, you use a lot of memory technique in the novel where it's flashback to 90s, 30s, and things like that kind of thing. Was that uh, the idea to, where you know someone asking early about the history where how you kind of memory is kind of tricky and reading the novel it, it's pretty clear about the sister because i don't think most readers do not have problem with the, the thing how do you device that to work along with the story of the sister because it's flashback back and forth well um i you know, when people ask you and you sort of uh, give the, a technical answer, they think, wow, you know, she figured all that out. Um, the way. Amazing. Yeah, you, the way you figure it out is that you write and then you revise and it doesn't, doesn't quite work. And then you try this and you try that. And originally I was just going to write a straightforward biography of the girls. 
but then I became interested in their characters. And novels are the truth, the truth, even if they're fictionalized, the truth according to character, because it's how we all experience the history of our time by being inside ourselves, you know. So we have a certain perspective, we have a certain setting, we have a certain family, and that influences how we're experiencing history. So I became interested in the characters and personalities of the four girls because they were so different. How did each one get, get act? so to be an activist, how did they get mobilized? How did Maria Teresa, how was that different from Patia? And so, um, part of the re part of the process was to go do hands-on research, in part because nothing had been written about them. So talking to the they was amazing. But you're right, memory is tricky. And she was just one participant. And she saw the sisters from the point of view of being a sister and in the same setting. So I also interviewed other people in the underground. I interviewed the pharmacist. Um, where they had gone to the drugstore. I the I went to the church where they had gotten married and baptized and talked to people in the community. I, in other words, I was getting different perspective and I felt like that was my job in in terms of being of doing the research, of getting the truth sits in the center, whatever that means. And for me, the truth is not one truth, but multifaceted and complex. And that's why the best stories, I think, aren't flat propagandistic. They give you the different facets. And so my job was to get all, as many little points around the center of that circle, uh, gathering information. And then some things would contradict each other. And by then I was getting a sense of each one's character and had a sense of what actually might have happened, you know, uh, from gathering that information. Okay, more questions that coming in. Uh, seeing the political climate, especially in Afghanistan and the oppression of women, how can Afghani uh, women can, can be activists in their homes and the use of social media to be liberated? Wow. Oh, you know, um, lamentablemente, as we say in Spanish, um, because you write a novel, uh, you don't really have answers because you're not really a strategist you're not really um you know i i would feel like i i think it's really tricky to try to um um colonize a country with your enlightened answers i think the thing to the thing that's most important is to empower and listen um, to the answers that come up from within and to support them. So um, I, I, I am, as are many, many uh, women, not just in this country, but around the world, heartsick and heartbroken of the situation um, of women in Afghanistan, of people in Afghanistan right now. Um, I, I, I know um, a little of what it's like to live um, in a disruptive, violent, um, a bloody society and how, um, how it stunts people and doesn't allow them their full, uh, the larger version of themselves. So uh, I think right now I'm, I'm troubled, listening, wondering what is a way to help. And I think one of the important things, I mean, we found out about that bombing being of a family, not of terrorists, because the New York Times broke the story. The story. What mobilized uh, a really um, terrified people who for 31 years put up with our dictatorship? the story of the middle Mirabal sisters, the story, a story that spread in the bloodstream of the imagination and got people mobilized and, and fired up to do something. 
So I think it's important not to, you know, sometimes I feel like we we're very much into the story and then the next um, big thing comes up and we forget not to forget um, what's happening there and, and to, in whatever way we can, uh, you know, lend our voices uh, to, to, in support and, and to get those stories told and not to forget, not to forget. Um, but that's such a, such a helpless and, and, you know, uh, a helpless and humble answer because I wish I did have the answers, um, but something must be done. I, I mean, I can't feel like it's okay um, that my little sisters, my fellow grandmothers, um, mothers um, are in that this dire situation. Thank you for that powerful answer. And I, I mean, as, as a, as for you as a writer, I think that in terms of writing, it's a, it's a perpetual act of uh, activism. I, I think that to have the reading your books, you know, girls around the world reading your books and uh, feeling the message of hope and the message of, uh, you know, uh, power. And that, I think that's very powerful in itself. Let's see another question. Feminism is not outright addressed in the book, but women are the for forefront and the main characters and are being written by a woman. Would you address the importance of feminism and activism and storytelling? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, it's not addressed outright because you're writing a novel. We didn't even have that word back then. You have to be accurate. You know, uh, people have asked me, well, why didn't you put this in? Because the Miravar sisters did not know about that. Uh, they were not, um, you know, remember, we're talking about a, 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 a little country where everything was controlled, all the media, all the outlets. So they didn't maybe know about things uh, that we said, but it was happening there. So um, I have to be true to the characters. Uh, that said, uh, they were, you know, living, growing up in the 40s in a, a very um, patriarchal culture, um, very governed by the uh, Catholic hierarchy. This was not the Catholic Church of Liberation Theology, but of people that blessed and were all, always a priest standing by uh, the dictator and masses in his honor and for his soul. So it was not, it was not a place where women were encouraged um, to even get an education or to be have public lives. Minerva, Minerva was the rare person. She insisted on an education. She went to law school and remember in the novel how the dictator punished her by he gave her he let her go through law school, but then did not grant the degree. I mean, what a, what a, you know, horrible uh, and exquisitely cruel punishment to her. So, but she was, um, she was very much um, a, a feminist, uh, very much an inspirer. Uh, in fact, it was her idea. I mean, she was the one that gathered the underground. But guess who the head of the underground was? Manolo Tavares, her husband. Because um, the, the group decided that a lot of men would not join if a woman was telling them what to do. So she, had, she stepped aside um, so that the underground would succeed. So even... It's not just, you know, uh, the dictatorship and the patriarchy. Even within activist movements, we have to be sure that we aren't replicating the systemic um, misogyny and the um, gender inequalities that are in the larger society, and the, which people can see out there, but they can't see it within their own group. So very, very important. Um, 
for feminists and a feminist can be male, female, or whatever spectrum on the, on whatever um, they are on the gender spectrum. But um, it's, it's important that we don't replicate, replicate the paradigm which we want to dismantle. Thank you, Julia. That was an amazing question, uh, answer. I also have a question of my own. Uh, you brought up Vaccine Hawkins and also uh, just finished about the question about feminism and especially ethnic writers when it comes to labels, uh, especially in the time at this time, there's a anti-racial theory studies in schools. And, you know, a lot of young uh, ethnic so-called minority writers and they, they don't like to do that label. And I'm talking about, uh, based on my reading of all, the, I, I, I read widely, all the, uh, especially uh, writer with, uh, with ethnic backgrounds. I mean, how do, you, how do you feel about being labeled as feminist writer or as, as a Hispanic writer or as, you know, people like Asian American writer, a lot of uh, young Asian American writer refuse that label and or they write completely not related to their racial groups or something like that. How do you feel about that? Well, first of all, I've, I've heard you struggling several times, uh, Tony, with having to call us a minority. And I just saw uh, yeah. um, a friend of mine just gave me a new term. She, when she talks about it, she calls, well, the, she calls it the global majority. Oh. She doesn't say minorities. She said, among um, communities of the global majority, because the global majority are people that aren't white, um, you know, uh, privileged people, uh, and, and not necessarily, you know, the traditional idea of, uh, of a mainstream American. So we are the global majority. So that, <laughs> and you. The way to use, you know, language is wonderful because it helps reframe the paradigm. Uh, so we have the global majority. Uh, I think, um, you know, I, I think it, I don't mind uh, people call, calling me a Latina, a Latinx writer, um, uh, a Hispanic writer, the original uh, term in the census. Um, if it just is a description of the tribe that I come from, the community I come from, the country I come from, the background, the roots, uh, because that, that you know those are the roots that allow me to thrive and feed my soul all those uh 24 uncles and aunts and their extended familia are inside me you know in our cultures many times we're not a me or not only a me we're a we you know and i feel like i carry those stories with me so yeah i mean i think it's as a description and we of the global majority know when it's being used as a description and it's and when it's being used as an othering or tokenism, or we have our one Latinx, this, that, or the other, you know, we're just checking a box, but there isn't a real opening of the circle and welcome in, this is for all of us, you know? So I don't mind it as a description, but I do notice how many times, um, you know, if you do want to write about something that isn't that subject, you're steered back. Like you only have one story to tell. Whereas stories, I mean, a thousand and one she told. Stories, if anything, teach us that we're, you know, the, the, that I can read about uh, a Danish prince I can read about a slave girl. I can read about Gilgamesh, 2,500 BC, searching in the underworld for his beloved dead friend, Ankidu. And I become these people. Stories teach us that we are each other and that the human heart, even 2,500 years ago, grieves like the present human heart. And this is, one, this is wonderful news. Should be on the news every night. But what's beautiful is that we bring our particular, uh, our particular imagination to bear on the experience of being alive. And some of those might be um, stories from our communities, um, and some of them might not. 
But I think part of it is that we also, as members of certain communities, feel compelled because we haven't seen our stories out there to tell those stories because the other stories have been told. Um, you know, I could write, let's say, about a farmer in Vermont, but there are many novels. But how many are, are, there, are there of a, a Dominican woman living in Vermont? So sometimes we ourselves feel compelled to add our story to the huge bookshelf of um, stories from all cultures. Um, but we shouldn't feel limited by it because the imagination um, allows us to become each other. And if that's what, again, I keep going back to, if that's what we brings us awake to tell a story, whether or not it's from our community, go for it. Go for it. Yeah. Thank so I think you. it's when it's being used to imprison and narrow down and put into a little cubicle, you know, you are in our stable of writers, you are the right, you are the writer who does this. Of course, any writer worth their salt um, wants to rebel against that. It's another form of constriction. Wow, thank you. Julia Alvarez, you sound amazing. <laughs> she had an action figure right behind her too. Um, oh. We have one, okay, it is time, and I'm gonna read some of the comments that people are sending in that enjoy so much. Great presentation. Uh, congratulations on providing your hopeful perspective and bringing, uh, see, sorry, and bringing people together during a fearful, divisive times. Uh, thank you for being a true writer, writing from a place of facts and not biases. Viva liberation theology! Yeah. <laughs> thank you again, Julia, for uh, you are a true philosopher. Oh. Uh, those are, yeah, those are a few amazing comments. And uh, Julia, thank you so much. This is a, a powerful and amazing presentation. And as I said before, we, we came into this presentation uh, just oh, one more question. Actually, sorry, uh, from Miss Beatrice. What are you? Well, what are you working on next? Oh, I can't wait to get back to my real work. I'm not a philosopher. I tell stories. You know, stories are a way of, you know, of reflecting and musing and considering and dealing with issues out there, but through character, through um, stories. And, and so I want to get back uh, to my work. I've been working on some poems because I've been doing so many events that I get distracted. But I, I am, you know, I have, I have at least two, if not three, um, novels that I really, you know, one of the things I say, I'm now 71. And what I want to, I want to feel like when, when my time comes and they ring me that there are, isn't a drop of story left in me. <laughs> I don't, I want to, t I want to tell these stories. And I also, of course, uh, want to encourage and applaud and the next and the next and the next generation of storytellers out there enlarging us as a community. But I think it's so important that we put our heads together because we are facing the biggest civil rights uh, issues in the world right now. Um, you know, our global health, our climate change, and the ways in which it will affect probably the most uh, helpless and the most impoverished. And uh, we've got to come together, you know, to resolve those and tell the stories that are going to inspire people uh, to be thinking about these huge global issues. So thank you. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Guadalupe and Beatrice and Chloe and all of you who have been here and that I haven't had the privilege of seeing. I just little comments. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you for everyone who are participating to today's special event with Julia Alvarez. And we have a month long celebration of the book in the time of the butterflies. So check out all the programs on the APL and on Public Library website. And this is a wonderful, powerful afternoon with Julia Alvarez. Thank you. My name is Tony Lamb, 
and have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank Bye. you, Tony. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. <laughs>